how we can do a lot of important um, new things such as the counters and basically anything that requires state. Um, so the most basic idea of sequential logic is that we have a storage element. And a storage element, we had said before, could be made from two inverter gates um, connected like this, because if you had a one here, it would get propagated through. Um, obviously, this isn't ideal because it's hard to change the value. So to change the value, you need to open this loop and insert a new value. Like if you insert a zero here, um, it would go one, zero, and again be reinforced. So a more useful version and sort of the most basic element you'll find is what we call the reset set or RS latch. Um, so the RS latch is built from two NOR gates here. You can also build it from two NAND gates in a similar manner. Um, and how it works is that when you put a certain input in it, it will stay in whatever state you set it to. So I'll go through an example here. If we initially say that Q is 0 and Q0 is 1, um, Q0 should be the opposite of Q based on the notation we're using. Um, you would see that. So this is what we have here. Here's the Q column. Here's Q0. And um, when we go through this experiment, we had said before it depends not only on the input, so the inputs are S and R here, but on the current state, which we're calling Q minus, as in the state when we change the SNR inputs. So if um, the state's initially zero here, we set R to zero and S to one. What you'll see is, so we have a zero here as well. Um, and then zero and one. If this was an OR gate, would give you one because it's an OR gate. It gives you a zero here at Q0. Um, a 0 and a 0 here will give you a 1 output, again, because it's a NOR gate. So Q turns to 1. Um, and this 1, again, goes down here now. But that output doesn't change, because 1 and 1 to the NOR gate still gives you 0. Um, so we now have the state of 0 for Q complement, or Q0, and 1 for Q. Um, if we keep S asserted, uh, again, as we saw, the output doesn't change. Now the thing is, when we still have the state of Q of 1, if we take away this S input, we turn it down to 0, um, what you'll find is we have 1 and 0 as the input to the NOR gate, um, and the output will still be 0, because internally there's a OR, the output's 1, we invert it for the NOR, and we get a zero. So what you see is that we've set the state to something, and even though we've removed that input, that S input, the state still stays. So if you go through the whole table, what you'll find is that the S input we call the set input. So when it's one, um, regardless of what the previous state was, the output always goes to one. Likewise, R is the reset input, so regardless of the previous state, the output always goes to zero. Um, finally, if both of them are zero, we're in what we call the hold state, um, so the output you can see is just the same as the previous state. So this is the RS latch. Um, and there's also, if you set S and R to both the um, one, this is an invalid state for this latch. Uh, I mean, logically, if you're telling it to set the output and reset the output, it doesn't really make sense. And what you'll actually see is that these outputs may go to the same value. So Q becomes 1 and Q0 becomes 1, which is invalid. Um, I said before, you can go through, if you want, to derive the equations of it. Um, and when we're, when we're using these latches and these stateful elements, a way you can think about it is that we have the R and S inputs um, as if we had combinational logic. So if we have R, S. Um, but one of the other inputs that's not directly marked is actually the current state of the Q output. Um, so you'll see one other input we add is the state of Q. Um, so when we map this, for example, we could call this R, this S, and this Q. Um, 
And what the output becomes is Q plus. So after this is applied, based on the current state of Q, we get a new state of Q, or what we're using, the notation of Q plus here. Um, so again, we can go through that and map it. I won't do that right now. Additional inputs. Um, some other stuff we'll add is that previously, whenever the inputs change, it would affect the output. Um, what we might find useful is to have an enable input so that only when the enable input is one um, are these inputs changed. So you might have this if some other circuitry is setting the input to the latch, and part of the time you don't want it to act on what these inputs are because maybe they're changing to their final state. Um, so in this case, if E is zero, because these are AND gates, what you see is the output here will be zero, zero. Um, so regardless of what the external RNS input is, it just holds the output. If E is 1, then it's going to pass these RNS through. Um, we also add, can add a reset and preset line. So what these do is these override the enable um, input. So for example, you may have a whole bunch of RNS latches and you can connect all the resets together. And when you just toggle that one line, it clears a whole bunch of them. For the rest of their use, that reset might be disabled as inactive, so you'd set it to zero in this case. Um, and you're just using the regular SNR inputs with enable. But the reset and preset can be used sort of to override um, that enable pin. So we can also, oops, damn it. I don't know why this crashes frequently, but as I had said before, the RNS latch has this problem that if the RNS are both one, um, what we'll run into is that it's some invalid state. So the output is not one, or the outputs are not complement of each other like we'd expect. You'd get Q is one and Q not is one, something like that. So that's obviously what we want to avoid or something we want to avoid. Um, so we have a simplified version we call a data latch. And um, how we do this, back is that we say we just want one input D um, and when D is one the output goes to one when D is zero the output goes to zero um, and we do that by putting connecting D to the set line having an inverter here um, so now what you can do is you can set the D in input to something and just put enable high when enables high for example if you put D to one um, enable goes high, and then what you'll see is that set this goes to one, the set, and the reset goes to zero, so it'll set the input to one. Um, the enable line you can bring low, and then it'll latch that value that you had at the D. So then D can change a whole bunch, put enable high again, and it captures the new value. And you can easily see, likewise, if D had been zero, you'd get zero here and one here. So this is the da data latch, and the symbol for it is that, thus. So we have the Q output. Q complement output, the D input, and the enable input. Um, so what we'll use more is what we call flip-flop. So latches, as long as this enable input was one, um, the output, you can think of it, gets connected to the input. So it's just continuously forwarding. So if you had something like the D line is this, um, and the enable line was this, say I'll go low there, what you'd have at Q is it would follow D as long as enables uh, high. When enable goes low, it's just going to save that last value. Uh, what we'll use, though, instead is we want something that when the enable line, say, goes high the first time, it just captures a single value, a single small value. Uh, so what we'll find more useful is that we have this characteristic where we're basically sampling on what we call a clock edge. Um, and how we do this is we use two flip-flops to form, two latches to form a flip-flop. And we have them hooked up like this, and I don't think I have a diagram there. So we'll say, um, say if clock goes like this. Um, initially, when clock is zero here, this enable is zero, so this flip-flop is in a hold position. Um, 
However, the clock has been inverted to this enable here. Um, so the first flip-flop is in a forward state. So whatever data is existing while the clock is low is being forwarded by this flip-flop to this point here. Um, but this flip-flop is not acting upon it. It's holding the previous state. When we see clock, um, just erase all this. when clock goes high now, so clock is one here, one here, one here, zero here. This flip flop was previously forwarding the data um, when clock was low, so it now goes into a hold position. So it holds whatever data was at its input right there and just keeps that data here. This flip flops now in a for or this latch is in a forward position, so it's forwarding that data that's being held to the output. Um, and when we have two latches combined like this, we'll call them a flip flop because what you can see is that this flip flop is holding whatever data occurred right at that transition point. So right when it went from low to high, it's going to hold the previous data and forward it to the output. So if we had, for example, a clock like this, um, so if that's clock, this is clock, and if we had data like this, so, you know, something like that, all it's the output will be is the value of data right at that clock edge. So it would go high here, next clock edge is here, it would stay high. Uh, my D is not like you mean before that clock. Yeah. Well, we don't. I don't know the state of it previously, so I'm assuming here it might have been high. If it had previously been low, um, like if you know D before had gone low, I didn't really leave enough space. Um, it would go high at that point. So up till here, I don't know. In this case, yeah, it may have been low. It may have been high. Um, and then it just stays on because there's no more clock edges. So even though the data input's changing here, because there's no clock edges, it just does nothing. Um, we may have a circle on the input to the flip-flop like this, and this, as in previous um, locations where that meant an inverter, it does effectively mean we've added a NOT gate here, um, which gives it the characteristic of rather than sampling on the rising edge, Rather than sampling here, it's going to sample on the falling edges. Um, so if we had something like that, and we had data, like high, low, stays low, um, it's actually going to only update its outputs at those points where the clock is going low. Um, so again, you'd have some indeterminate state, say it was low here. Um, because D is high at this point, it goes high, or if it had already been high, stay high. Um, here, D is high, so it stays high. And finally, here, D is low, so it goes low. Um, so you can see this symbol means that we're falling edge trigger, we call it. So if it's just a triangle, it's on the rising edge, the positive clock edge. It's, there's a circle, it's on the negative or falling block edge. Um, when we're dealing with flip-flops, we'll have some timing issues. Um, one of them is that we can imagine when we had designed them, we had these sort of this idea that there's two latches in series, and the first latch is holding this data, and then the next one's forwarding it. Um, so obviously, for this latch to actually receive that data, the data needs to be present at some point before um, this transition occurs. So we have what we call the setup time, which is to say that this data needs to be valid um, at least some amount, finite amount of setup time before the positive clock edge, the active clock edge. Likewise, once the clock changes, we have a hold time, um, which is to say that the data must remain you know, valid at the same state as it was before the clock edge for some amount of time, for the whole time. If you violate these timing specs, you sort of tend to get um, 
bad behavior, we'd say. So you'll get into undefined areas. The outputs may not be what you expect. You may get um, extended power consumption or it delays other areas of your circuits. Um, so basically, you can never violate this setup and hold times when you're dealing with flip-flops. They are, you know, for what we're doing, they're quite small in the nanoseconds range, but obviously if you start to have um, quicker clocks, this becomes an issue. Um, and there will also be some other timing specs like the minimum clock time, so the pulse width here has some minimum, and there's a finite delay between when the output gets updated. So here we, I have, for example, the clock edge is changing here, but I'm showing that the output doesn't actually update till this later time. So there's some delay as the data moves through the flip-flop. Um, one of the more popular flip-flops is we had the RS latch I showed you, and you can make an RS flip-flop where we still have the issue that if R is 1 and S is 1, it's bad. So they fix that with what they call the JK flip-flop, and this is one of the most common flip-flops we'll be using. Um, and with the JK flip-flop, it's very similar to the RS. So we can see, for example, when K is 1, K is effectively the reset, um, the output always goes to 0. When J is 1, which is effectively the set, the output always goes to 1. Uh, the difference is that if you tie J and K to 1, rather than being undefined, the output just toggles. So if the previous state was 0, it becomes 1. If the previous state was 1, it becomes 0. Um, and we still have the hold state when J and K are both 0. In the same way, we can map this, where we have A is J, B is K. And again, we're going to consider one of the inputs, the previous state um, of Q. So from that, you could, again, go through and map, for example, 0, 0, 1, 1. And I won't go through all of them because take a minute. 0, 0, 1. And you can map all the ones and create the equations of what Q plus is equal to. So you could say Q plus is equal to based on J and K and Q. Um, another flip-flop type we have is what we call the toggle or T flip-flop. If we tie J and K together, um, we'll have this characteristic that if this input T is 1, the output will just toggle between what it previously was. So if the output 0 becomes 1, 1, 0. Um, if T is 0, so we toggle. If T is 0, then the output is just held in the current state. Um, so that's an example of building another type of flip-flop from the JK flip-flop. And actually, today we'll be talking about a procedure um, for doing all that. So I'll take a break before moving into the new stuff for today, maybe.